I'll get to that. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to start my series of lectures on the Calk Proof Assistant. Uh, I put a URL up here. I, I can tell several people have gone there because they've asked if there's a problem that there's nothing there. In fact, that is precisely the specification for this point in time. And files will pop up there after the lectures containing the code that I showed in that lecture. So uh, a little bit of background about me. I was actually at OPLSS as a student in summer of 2004. So it's, uh, it's great to be back. Uh, at that time, I was just getting started using the Calk Proof Assistant. And of course, I'll tell you more about what Calk is. There, w there weren't many resources about Calk at that point. Uh, there weren't any books or anything. So uh, I'm glad to have the chance to contribute to providing more educational materials and an introduction to Calk in this setting. And hopefully, you'll find uses for it in uh, various different kinds of research projects and maybe even practical stuff. I also wanted to mention, in the context of this summer school, uh, applications of type theory and so forth, uh, one of the other hats that I wear besides using Calk to do formal proofs is designing and implementing a programming language called Urweb, which is a domain-specific language for web applications that is actually based on dependent type theory. It powers web applications that together have thousands of users. By some halfway reasonable measures, it's the highest performance web framework today. So if you want to uh, get more information on that, visit my web page, which is easy to find as long as you know how to spell my last name, which is close to a globally unique identifier. <laughs> and, it, it, and that's also my, a, a prefix of the URL written there is my home page. So yeah, so let me say a bit more about what is Calk. Uh, Peter already explained a, a bit about this, saying that you might want to use the Agda system for programming. And you might want to use the Cox system for proving large theorems. I, th I think that's a pretty good summary. And let me draw a picture that sort of expresses the big idea of how Cox works. So I should say that in contrast, especially to the lectures from earlier this week, I'm really going to be presenting a kind of engineering perspective instead of a kind of scientific or mathematical perspective here. I'm going to talk about how to build things in ways that give you confidence about them. And Bob Harper mentioned that he saw a kind of failure mode in past years of this summer school where people were proving all these theorems, and they didn't know quite how it worked. But the proof assistant accepted the results. For me, that is a great outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Under, understanding is an expense that you want to avoid wherever possible when you're building something, right? So I'm not going to talk about foundational type theories. I'm going to write some programs and write down some proofs. And if the proof assistant gives us the thumbs up, we can be happy. And then after the summer school, if you want to look into some of the theoretical details or do some sort of on-the-fly isomorphism process between what I'm doing and what happens in the other lectures, then I think that's a very useful thing to do. But given six lectures, I'm going to focus on the pragmatics of sort of design and implementation of verified software. So what exactly is Calk? What does it help you do? So at the center, there's a type theory called Galena. So, so Calk is named after the French word for rooster, and Galena is hen in, in French. So hence this connection. The type theory at the core of Calk is Galena. And there is a type checker. which is going to tell you whether your program's type check. And via the curry howard morphism, the correctness or convincingness of a proof is identified with the fact that a certain term type checks. So this type checker is the most important piece that tells us when an argument is convincing. And then we're going to do some programming with a convenient surface syntax that has some extra features like, for instance, the implicit arguments along the lines of what Peter showed us. That's not part of the core type theory. It gets kind of desugared into the core type theory via type inference and other more basic syntax expansion kind of stuff. And so in this surface syntax, we'll be able to write down what we're trying to prove. So we have some theorem statements here. <coughs> 
And then there are all sorts of different ways we can actually prove the theorem statement. So we're, we're going to have all sorts of different proof tools, which can actually be implemented in all sorts of different programming languages, follow all sorts of different strategies. Yes? OK, uh, this, is, this might be a little dangerous. Let's live on the, the wild side and lift the screen for now. Sure. Right. So we have all these different things. These are programs that know how to build terms in this type theory. So the sort of human input coming in on this side, driving these different tools, which are, live in, in an ecosystem that it, its center is producing terms in this one type theory, the global standard of meaning in Koch uh, proofs. And the most important one of these boxes is what I'll call the, the tactic engine. We have a, a language called LTAC, which is basically a, a language for writing proofs in a kind of style that transforms one thing you want to prove into some other things that you want to prove, which imply the original thing. And so what we do is we write what's called a proof script, which feeds into the tactic engine. And the proof script can also orchestrate calling other proof tools like SMT solvers or whatever else that have been instrumented to produce these, these terms in the type theory in the end. So one of the most important things about this picture is how we can draw a kind of a boundary between these regions. Essentially, you can draw a box that excludes all those details of how we come up with the proofs. And so then this region here, We have the part of the system we have to trust to believe that when we think we've proved a theorem, we have actually proved it. We need to, of course, trust the definition of the type theory itself and the code that checks the, the terms. We need to somehow believe enough about this process that goes from surface syntax into the type theory. And we need to believe that we, we stated our theorems correctly. But there's this whole other world of arbitrary complexity in actually constructing these proof terms where mistakes there should not be able to get us to accept a theorem that is not actually true. Because all of this complex reasoning machinery here produces output to justify its decisions in terms of this small type theory, which is roughly on par with what we've seen uh, for Agda and some of the, the stuff that Bob Harper presented. So in contrast to, say, a usual story of building a program with many la different languages and tools, where a bug in any one of those languages can make your program crash and burn, in Calk we have this nice abstraction boundary where bugs in your proof process cannot cause you to incorrectly accept a, a false result. So in that sense, this is sort of justifying why it's not scary that things can work out as Bob mentioned, where you've proved a big theorem and you're not quite sure how it worked, that's OK, because you're over here, and the trusted part is over here. You're, it's important to get the theorem statement right, but the proof is outside of the so-called trusted base, to use uh, security terminology. Any questions about this part before I start showing you some code? OK. So really, the, the agenda that I'm going to try to support, I'll show you some of the, the basic tools that can lead up to the point of being able to, for instance, verify functional correctness properties of some system that includes, uh, actually, I'll start the screen going down while I talk. You, you have some system that includes some hardware and an operating system, and you're using a compiler, and you have some application, and it's all connected together. Calk actually makes it possible to prove a deep property about this whole system, establishing independent results about the different parts. And you can then link those results together to get one property about the whole system. And you don't have to trust anything about the proof tools that were used for any of these pieces. You can use different tools for the hardware and the application, for instance. And yet you can interface the, the theorems you've proved with a, a pretty small amount of 
of trusted code, just the code that checks these, these proof terms in the end. So uh, most important question, how do we feel about this font size? Is this, is this good? There's always a trade-off between being able to fit enough stuff and making individual characters more readable. Can you make it dark background? Dark background. <laughs> I see. I think that might be more, uh, that might take long enough to be counterproductive right now, but um, maybe for the future ones I could prepare for that. Slightly bigger. Slightly bigger, OK. In that case, let's, uh, anyone have a favorite Emacs uh, font size that would be perfect here? I can start with this one that I sometimes use. We'll see how that goes. OK. Uh, but then it doesn't get saved across both opening and closing. <laughs> All right. so. Let me start off by just doing some programming so we can ground this in something really concrete. I'm going to, st so first uh, I'm in Emacs and I'm using uh, an Emacs mode called Proof General. There's also a, a standalone Coq IDE that some people like to use. I have minimal experience with it myself. I prefer to stick with Emacs. And uh, another important point, my recommended mode of participating in these lectures is not to try to follow along typing these things in your own personal Coq system, though that might be a good deal for some people. I'm going to try to do this interactively, so I will be your IDE, and you can have that experience without having this loaded on your, your laptop. And then we'll have the hands-on session, uh, a, a few of them about Coq, and that will be the opportunity to actually do the, the typing yourself. So I'll be, I'll be asking for audience participation here, uh, trusting each person to judge whether their level of Familiarity with caulk is such that they'll get the answers too quickly and it's not worth coming in when I ask for advice about what to do at each point. I'm hoping we can kind of learn together about the right way to, to drive this kind of tool. And yeah, like I said, this code will appear at that URL at, at, after this lecture is finished and so on for each of the future lectures. All right, so the basic mode is a little different from the one we saw with, with Agda. We're going to basically move the cursor to some point and then say, I want Coq to run to that point also. And then the, the background changes to this different highlighting to indicate that this content has been processed. All the later content that's not highlighted has not been processed. And for all we know, it could be full of typos. Uh, probably not true in this case. but. We can proceed very incrementally here. And uh, here's an example of a comment. Cock is happy with the comment. It's a good start. <laughs> so uh, here's a, an example of an inductive type definition, which corresponds to an algebraic data type definition in, say, ML or Haskell. We're saying, I'm introducing a new type called EXP, or exp for expression. And it's a set. Here, set means the same thing. It's meant in several contexts in other lectures. And there are three constructors for building expressions. We have one called constant that takes a natural number, written as nat, and produces an expression. So let me actually write up on the board a grammar for this, just so it's completely clear what we're talking about. This is basically saying an expression is a number or an addition of two expressions or multiplication of two expressions, and the numbers are drawn from the natural numbers. So we get the, those binary operators by having a constructor like plus that is written as taking two expressions as inputs, and here the the fact of having two different arguments is written in a, a curried style like you see in many functional programming languages. <coughs> so let's process that. I didn't say it yet. It okay. happens to be control C, control enter. But uh, yeah, with the interface you're using, the key combination is asking me to, to m move the point forward. <laughs> All right, so we have a definition of a type. And now we might want to define an operation on that type. Here's one called eval that is going to take an expression and 
evaluate it to produce a number. So we write the keyword fixed point for a recursive function, and we give a type for the argument, and the, here's the return type. We use a pattern matching construct, which is very similar to the ones in ML or Haskell. We check to see what kind of expression we're working with. If it's a constant, we just pull out the number n, that is the argument, and we return that. If it's a plus, we get two sub-expressions, e1 and e2. We should evaluate those and add them together. And if it's a time, as we do the same thing, where I write a star instead of a plus. You can use Unicode in Coq, but I'm not going to be doing it. So we have an asterisk instead of anything fancier. Sorry. But this is an evaluation function. Yes, in the back. Yes, I'm using standard library definitions of arithmetic on natural numbers here. In a few moments, we'll go back and reconstruct that stuff from more first principles. Yeah. There are. All the functions need to terminate. <laughs> and I won't go into too much detail about that here. I will, by purest coincidence, write only definitions that Koch accepts as terminating. Uh, the conditions are pretty straightforward, but there are some twists. If you happen to know the, the keywords primitive recursion, that's basically what it is, but it means something less primitive than in other contexts. Were there any other questions? Yeah. Right. Right. Okay, well, let's go on. And I have one more function here, the kind of thing you only write when you're looking for an example of a theorem to prove. What if we switch the order of all the operators, of all the operands to the operators? I'm glad you asked. Here's how we would do it. And we will prove that this preserves the meanings of the operators. This is a recursive function that goes from expressions to expressions. It leaves constants alone. It maps any constant to itself. For a plus, it commutes all the arguments within the two operands and then switches the order. So we're recursively switching the order of all the operands throughout the whole expression tree. And this also is a well-founded definition. But before I prove something about that, I wanted to back up to something more basic and sort of uh, building on a question that was asked. The operators like times, in contrast to most programming languages, are not built into Coq. They are defined from first principles using more basic concepts in type theory. So let's go back and start defining the natural numbers. And actually, before I do that, in case you're wondering about this funny split into three different panels in my Emacs window, this panel in the middle is just completely wasting space now because we haven't proved any theorems yet. Good stuff will pop up there when we do. Down at the bottom, we're getting this constant feedback from the Cox system, like you asked me to define that, and I did it. That also will be more interesting if there are mistakes in the programs. And I'm sure some of those will come up sooner or later. OK. So here's a definition of the natural numbers. I'm using, I've sort of alpha varied it to use different versions of identifiers that are intentionally not what appear in the standard library, just to avoid confusing name clashes for this presentation, because I'll go back to the standard library version afterward by just using the normal names instead of the strange names here. So this is an inductive definition of the natural numbers. And let me write this out in more of inference rule notation. So this, this definition says, basically, we have one inference rule that says 0 is a natural number, and another one that says we have this function uh, SUCC that stands for successor, or plus 1. So if we have some natural number n, then its successor is also a natural number. It's kind of the most basic inductive definition that is not trivially recursive. It's a definition of a type in terms of itself. And it happens to correspond to our usual intuitive idea of the natural numbers. We can write any number. We have any number k is really just encoded as the repeated application of the successor function k times to the, the zero constructor. So that's the isomorphism with our usual uh, 
grade school idea of what are natural numbers. But to test that this is a useful definition, we might want to reconstruct more of the grade school operations, like we might want to add two numbers together. So here's a recursive definition of add. I guess this is along the lines of what Bob showed in an earlier lecture, just with different syntax, where you have two natural numbers, n and m, and we're going to produce another natural number as the result. And so we check. As in his example, we can sort of do recursion on the first argument or the second one. I'm going to do the first one here because that happens to be the convention in, in Calk at least. So if we're adding 0 to any number, that has no effect. We just return that number m. And if we're adding the successor of some number n prime, we just return the successor of the result of adding n prime to m. And this turns out to exactly mirror our usual idea of addition on the natural numbers. All right, so now we're going to want to prove some theorems. And to do that, we'll need induction. And the natural numbers are a good starting example for the general concept of induction in Koch because we all know the usual mathematical induction principle. I want to show how we can derive that principle using some general rules that takes any inductive type definition and produces its induction principle. So the way that works is we want an induction principle to show that for all n in the natural numbers, some predicate holds of n. And to do that, we'll have some proof obligations. And we can read those obligations off of the inference rules that we use to define the original type itself. So let me, I'll erase this part because it's not directly related. What we'll do is everywhere that we said, we had a rule that concluded some